Family Special Finance and Audit Committee meeting for April 5th, which is a remake of our previous meeting that we didn't have a forum in a couple of weeks ago. Uh, um, any introduction of late items, uh, Mr. Newman? No, we do not have any late items. May I have a motion to not be judicially as presented? Moved by Councilor Hong, seconded by Councilor Thorpe. Any discussion? All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Uh, the minutes of the Finance and Audit Committee meeting held uh, on Wednesday, March 8th at 9.30. Motion to adopt the best Moved by Councilor Hong, seconded by Councilor Yoko. Any discussion? Call the question, please. On favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Um, the first presentation is our 20 year investment plan, asset management update, and DCT review. So, three subject matters so I'll be under one subject heading. Um, Mr. Miller, if you could please introduce this for us and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Duncan and Mr. Lindsay are going to be the same. Uh, Two presentations, one on the asset management aspect, looking at uh, our capital plan for the next 20 years and also looking at our development cost charges and uh, there are reports that you will deal with in item 6, but we'll start off with the presentations. Welcome. Have fun. <laughs> Okay, so today is the presentation, um, as we said, it's on the 20 year investment plan. This is really the first time the city has prepared the 20 year plan, so we're pretty excited about it. Also, another asset management update, and we'll talk about uh, how many times we've done that and why we do that. And also, the DCC review. So first of all, what I want to say is the sky is not falling. You're going to see really big numbers here, but we also have some solutions and recommendations. So we'll talk about that. <laughs> So this is, we're going to do a quick asset management refresher. We all talk about asset management. And I think we have a couple numbers planning by now, but let's just make sure we do. Um, again, the 20-year plan. Uh, when, you, when you follow our management business and asset uh, planning is going to provide an update on our asset management uh, uh, plans right now. And uh, Dale Lindsay, our Director of Community Development, will update you on the ongoing DCC report. And at the end, recommendations. So first of all, the asset management framework, which we talk about a lot. This is the asset management framework. Asset management is all about putting the infrastructure in place to deliver services. The framework, this is one of our best lineups. It follows uh, the planning process very closely <coughs> where we assess our infrastructure and decide what we need to do to be new or construct, where we put plans in place, identify resources that we need, and then we execute. And the cycle is always continuous. And you can ask people like Doris and Wendy and Bill and Art, it never ends. And what is that? So asset life cycle starts with we do we need infrastructure to deliver services, plan it, we construct it, we operate and maintain it, we monitor it to see how the condition is, is it performing, is it doing what we want it to do, what we need it to do, we renew it and we have it, and sometimes we discuss it. That's the asset life cycle. In this 20-year plan, we're going to be focusing on investment, not operations and maintenance. And we'll see in the next asset management update that we may do in a few years, we'll bring in the last piece so that you'll see the impact of what new infrastructure has on our annual operating and maintenance plans. We have an asset management steering committee. This steering city committee has been in place probably since about 2008. It's a uh, multidisciplinary team. And we have representatives from development, engineering, facilities, finance, and, and IT. We meet on a sort of regular basis. We basically uh, meet around um, improvement initiatives that we're working on in the organization. We do education and training. We have developed and we have updated uh, an infrastructure life cycle planning model. We work on identifying funding strategies. And right now we're working on our governance. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So, what's going to be the asset management progress? 
For the city's all start asset management. The city's own infrastructure needs deliver services. But back in about 2004, asset management became a discipline. There was uh, ISO standards put in place, methodologies, practices, principles. And then in 2008, asset management became uh, a lot higher profile among local governments with the uh, communication that there was backlogs in infrastructure renewal among local governments. So in 2008, the city, led by a uh, general manager at the time, said, hey, we, we can do better. So how are we going to do that? So we started with education, training, and communication. We implemented that asset management steering committee in 2008. In 2010, we brought the first asset management plan to council. And that plan, at that time, included just engineering and public works infrastructure. And it provided an assessment of what that infrastructure, the condition of it was at that point in time. So in 2012, this is the work, and we brought forward another asset management update to council. And we had all the city's infrastructure. We identified what the long-term infrastructure law needs were. We focused on the 20 years as well. And we identified the funding gap. In 2013, council approved three new asset management reserves and annual increases to property taxes and user fees for those reserves to address that funding gap, to start to address it. So this question at the end, or can I do it? I'll forget by then. Right, <laughs> so. Thank you. We have three sections for the presentation, so at the end of each section, uh, questions that would be great to yeah. take those ones. So now, today, we are going to bring you another asset management update, as well as our 20 year investment plan. So, 20 years of investment plan sounds like a long time. So, why would we do that? So, a 20 year investment plan gets attention directly. It, it can identify and will identify emerging issues, and it gives us an opportunity for some proactive decision making. So how do we get here? Well, this was pretty challenging, and I can't uh, emphasize enough the work that was done by many people in this organization to develop this premier plan, and the DCC review, and the latest asset management update. We had cross-functional teams, and often it's the same people and the same teams doing the work. We completed the work over the past two years. The DCC review started over a year ago. The asset management update this past year. So the outcome has been a 20 year plan, the asset management update, and the DCC review. So, how do we bring together or develop a 20 year plan? And this is what we talked about last week. And all the different planning processes we have and goals that we have. And how do we bring all of that together into one plan to inform decision makers? So what we did is we started off first of all with those infrastructure renewal plans, those long-term plans. Then we added on the DCC review, the new project list from the DCC review. So the DCC review identified what expected growth is and what sort of uh, upgrades or new infrastructure would be needed to support that growth. So we added that on. Then what we do in departments is we do 10-year plans. And that's the first step in prioritizing projects and taking projects to that next level of concept or design or cost estimates. That's the first step. This is also the part where we start to implement master plans, adopt the plans, like the transportation master plan, like the Harewood Centennial master plan, cultural plan. Because, of course, those plans are ambitious. They can't be, you know, likely not implemented in all but that's where we start to try to prioritize and bring those plans in. Strategic initiatives. Well, Council has last, last update, uh, done completed last year, your strategic plan update, where you've identified the priority initiatives. 
So what we have done in this 20-year plan is we have the components of those initiatives that are in the current five-year plan. So they by no means are earlier completed, but components of them are. And then, of course, we have the five-year plan, the 2017-2021. So as we layer in all of these plans to create that 20-year plan, <laughs> Ms. Duncan, do you want do you want to actually sit at the end of the table and would that be in your order? I'm better standing. Okay. okay. So the big thing with the planning processes, again, as we talked about it, is those um those longer term bigger those longer term plans again going through here from our current asset, our current infrastructure to our DCCs, our new, our growth ones that we need for growth. We start to prioritize here in our ten year plans, and then of course prioritize and fund in the five year plans. So as the planning processes advance, investment timing and cost estimates may change. That's the way it is with long-term plans. So what's our current funding strategies? So current funding strategies for investments and for external revenues. We have about $7 million a year in, that we put in from general revenues to, to investment our projects. We have our asset management reserves, <coughs> money from those reserves each year, and we take the fund projects from those reserves each year. We have specific reserves for IT and equipment and facility development. Again, money contributions go into those reserves each year, and of course, they come out again to fund projects. We have the DCC reserves. So those are monies we collect from developers into those reserves and then come out to fund those DCC projects. We also have grants and private contributions. So in the 20-year investment plan, we did not make any assumptions around grants or private contributions. We don't know what they will be or if they will be. But of course, we will always actively pursue them. So debt, debt is not really a funding source, as we have to repay it. So debt, if, to, to repay debt, we're going to have to use these funding sources to repay it. But what debt does is it will push down the funding gap and spread it out for years. We excluded the new strategic infrastructure reserve and the payment and new estimates, which we often call it here, payment and move taxes. And why we did that is because this reserve was created by the Council for Strategic Projects. They're not in this 20-year plan, therefore we won't use that, that reserve. Okay. <coughs> okay, numbers. So, we put together all of these projects and plans and information, and what did they come up with? So what we have here is the investment, projected investment needs over the next 20 years. We have it by general sewer and water. We have it by renewal and DCC. We have it broken out between growth, which we would want to fund this from DCCs. And we have it broken out by existing residents, which we would fund from all of those other, other sources, other reserves, general revenues. One thing you'll notice here is that DCCs has a portion for growth and a portion for renewal. Often DCC projects will have a component of renewal as well as growth, so replacing a pipe and upsizing it. And then there's an allocation between the two. That's new. That's different for us. That's new. We haven't done that before, have we, for a long time, have we? Well, we always have. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, in allocated to growth, our investment here is $227 million projected to be over the next 20 years for renewal and some strategic <coughs> is $5 million. So, over the next 20 years, just over a billion dollars projected investment. Some projects we excluded from. In the uh, solution or whatever the decision will be around the fire station number one is not in here because we don't know what that will be. We didn't have a number for it to be conservative. We excluded it. 
The expansion for the police operations building is not in here. They're doing a space needs study. We don't know if or what that will look like, so we excluded it. Overwhelmingly, of course, these dollars relate to roads, drainage, sewer, water, facility one of existing facilities. <coughs> Okay, so over a billion dollars investment projected over the next 20 years, how are we going to fund it? Well, we have lots of great strategies in place already for funding investment. We have that allocation of general payments. We have those contributions to those asset management reserves, to IT, to equipment replacement, to um, facility development. We have BCC rates, BCC contributions. So our projected funding from those sources that we receive each year is seven hundred and ninety four million. So compared to the one point one billion, so where we're short is one hundred and seventeen million in DCCs. Which will be addressed through the new DCC model. 141 million short for renewal and upgrades. And you'll see here that in general we're short 81 million. In sewer, we actually have 11 million dollars left in reserves at the end of 20, uh, 20 years. That's what we're projecting. In short, in water, 70 million. One thing to think about reserves too, and we'll talk about it later, is <coughs> looking at things like minimum balances. And that's again about addressing risk from our project costs and time. So the total total projected shortfall is 238 million over 20 years. And this is what it looks like. So it's like this. I look to it. And when Wendy does the presentation on asset management, updates will talk to you a little bit more about which part what causes those spikes. But this is our current funding level right here. So again, in long term planning, to repeat, timing and cost will vary, right? Because we have constraints around funding, we have constraints around resources. And we may have to push some of that out. strategies to reduce the funding gap and we will come back to this at the end of the presentation but I didn't want to leave you there without some solutions before we move ahead. So strategies to the funding gap, the annual increase to the general asset management reserve that 1% finishes in 2017. So that's one of the strategies to be to continue that 1% increase to 20 for another five years to 2022. That would mean $10 million a year would go into the general asset management reserve. We have, over the past five years, well, including 2017, put just under $25 million into that general asset management reserve. The projected balance at the end of 2017 is $5 million. So you can see, while we are contributing, we are using. Okay. The, the next strategy would be to complete the DCC review and uh, change the bylaw in the DCC rates. The next one is to continue improving our asset management capacity. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that at the end, what the, that specifically means. In fact, what are the initiatives that we're currently working on? And the last one, of course, is always to continue to pursue grants and private contributions. So any questions before we move to the next step? I'll, I'll go to uh, Councillor Yolkman and Councillor Gibb. I'll thank you just quickly on <coughs> early in the presentation. First of all, thank you for the presentation. Um, really a simple funny question, but from um, simple at times. It's, it said infrastructure in 20, I'm not sorry, I'm 2010, um, when you started this great work, uh, we started uh, infrastructure, and then in 2012 it says all city infrastructure. So what's the difference between infrastructure versus all infrastructure? What were we missing? So in 2010, we focused only on engineering and public works infrastructure, so roads, drainage, sewer, and water. Okay. That was the big question. Um, 
Derek, you're going to fix me up. Because <laughs> 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 then we did all city infrastructure. So we did all of those plus facilities, plus IT, plus okay. uh, parks amenities. Yeah. Just need clarity from us. Thank you. Yeah, okay. um, thank you. Um, thanks for the information. It's, it's getting better all the time. I see quite an improvement. Um, the strategic plan, um, the strategic funding, and the PILTS is not included. But in the strategic plan, uh, or strategic fund, is the uh, the money from casino still involved in that? Oh, yeah, that's it. Just the way Yeah, okay. Um, do, where does the RDN fit in when we have a budgeting in this process for RDN infrastructure that is at an immense pace right now? Have you included any of that as our cost for our cost <coughs> for RDN, or is it still just a separate requisition? RDN is separate. That confused that, 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 infrastructure. That's still. Still, we could have a five-year what's happened, and that, so I'll, I'll continue to push on that as much as I can. What is the assist factor in our DCCs now that you talk about here on a complete review? So, Gail probably talk about that more, but it's Later. one, one okay. percent for each of them except water. Yeah, okay. Now, you're one billion in 20 years in general sewer water. Talking to Councillor Yoakum's point, what is the other amount, and, and does general include the rest of our facilities, fire, all of our all of our other stuff. That's not included in that one billion for twenty years, is it? Yes, so that's in the general. One billion is completely is over general sewer. One billion in just projected. Every asset we own being managed. But I thought we had about two billion dollars of the asset. We have the current replacement value of our Okay, that's the seven hundred thousand compared to the law. So just to click just to clarify that a little bit. So our current infrastructure right now, the current replacement value is three billion dollars. So our projected investment is one billion dollars over the next twenty years. Because of course a component of that is new upgraded infrastructure. Okay. Now, and as that new uh, newfangled stuff becomes appropriate in more places, it will become a little bit more, less expensive. Hopefully, um, a little bit of a follow-up today. So this is one. This is two hundred and fifty-seven thousand at today's dollars with no inflation rate. So I calculated a one percent inflation rate per year. Uh, we're up to like um, two eighty in ten years. So we have no idea on that because we can't. I, if I could see in the future, I wouldn't be sitting here. And that's why we didn't. If I could have seen in the future for years ago, I wouldn't have been sitting here. But so that's so. But so a one percent growth kicks in a lot on that too. So and three billion is our total asset value now. What would that have been in 2010 when you started? Well, we, in 2012, we had just over two billion dollars um, as the estimated current replacement cost. So, what has changed since then is, of course, we have new infrastructure. We have the water treatment plant. We have this building. Every year, we add infrastructure from developers. Also, when we did the asset management update, and maybe we'll talk about this more, is we updated our assumptions on replacement cost estimates and use for life. And of course, they never go down. So, I know useful life goes down, it always goes down. Um, one follow up on this. What is your, did, you, did anybody, very soon to Victor, um, through you, Mr. Chair, what concern do you have that, say, a federal budget is pretty equal to its asset costs every year? A provincial budget runs at about one to ten, one tenth of its yearly budget. But if we're three billion and we're at two hundred million dollars a year spending, we're way low on our ability to replace our assets under the current financial situation, under a massive event like a earthquake, seismic event, big one. So we're at $200 million a year. That's a small percentage of our $3 billion assets. Is that a concern? Is that a, when I look carefully, they're pretty equal to their assets, equal to their budget. Um, you know, like I, I, I just, is that a concern to us? So. It's a concern, it's not a concern, because it's a, it's a game of chances, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so all this three billion is not going to be placed in one go, under normal circumstances. Yeah. If you were to be hit by an earthquake, then you have a different scenario. And we talked about this, I think, in the last few months, where if that were to happen, uh, and we have good examples by happening up north, if that were to happen, then you have provincial and federal, you know, disaster assistance kicking in. At that point, you're really not worried about defensive staff, you're worried about 
basic survival things like <coughs> take water, shelter and stuff like that. So you begin to rebuild from there. Continuity, business continuity, life yeah, continuity. Yeah, so, so your risk management kicks into play. Uh, and so what we're talking about here is your kind of like a 20-year, assuming that things continue on a normal pace. Uh, but if you get to, uh, you were hit by a, a big one, whatever that one is, then the scenario changes. One of the 22 different disasters we have could affect. Okay, so 20 years times 20, 200 million, and we grow at a percentage a month. Just, just to build on that, because so there's something, and there's something quite complicated. I like simple. Yeah. I don't think they replace the good bus planning processes, which is what we're trying to build here. So, yeah, they're simple and you can get to an answer quickly, but build but a good you, robust plan. Funny, can I push the motions to get this done? I push the motions, so I quite honestly understand the complicity <coughs> it is. Quite honestly, and I know the city infrastructure very well. Thank you very much. Anything else? I just have, if I may, so you indicated that so we're 250 plus or minus million short over the 20 years in the forecast. And it doesn't include the police station and the fire hall. Is it reasonable for me to assume that it doesn't include like a public works it does rebuild? Include that. Oh, okay, thank you. And also, one other thing is we did have to renew for departure day activity center to gain pending council's decision. So, what you'll find in this long term plan. So, can, can I yeah, say, sure. So, will we get to the list? of things that have been included or excluded. And so that, absolutely can provide so that I will ask those yeah. questions. <coughs> But even, even more than that is we'll be always updating these 20 year plans. So as council makes decisions and as we have better information, these 20 year plans will be updated. Okay, so just to follow up, my, my question is, so is Chase River Community Hall uh, included in this summary? We have to look at that. Yeah. So, yeah. Those, those are just yeah. examples for me. If you give us the specific list, we could. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can we follow up on that? So all of the list of all of our assets, do we have a, a, a list? And this renewal will take care of every asset. Fire hall, police, everything? So for fire station number one, and again, based on assumptions around timing and cost estimates. So we will provide you the details. So we can try not to bore you with the details. But I think the important part to understand is the exclusions that she has outlined, like firewall number one, there's work going on right now, right? Uh, the police uh, space, there's work going on to establish what that looks like. One of the genius reasons of not including use of the strategic infrastructure reserve is so when that kind of infrastructure is ready to go, and the council of the day decides that's a priority, then you can fall into that. That's um, that's thank you. All right, we're good to go. Thank you. So the next piece is a cost management update. When do you think to provide us with money? And actually, my first slide is going to break down that three billion dollars for you. The first slide here so you have the three billion dollars by type, and I just want to go over them a little bit to so understand what's included in each infrastructure. So, under the water utility, that includes our new water treatment plant. It includes two water supply dams. It includes our reservoirs, distribution and supply mains, as well as control stations. Our sewer utility is our force mains, our mains, and our lift stations. Drainage is just exclusively our drainage mains. Transportation includes roads, bridges, sidewalks, street lights, as well as traffic controllers. Our park amenities include seven recreational towns, sports fields, play equipment, and trails. Facilities includes major facilities such as Sark and City Hall, as well as all our minor facilities such as the Vancouver Island Military Museum. In IT, we only include our <coughs> fiber optic network as well as our major servers, so it doesn't include like desktops. And then our fleet is all city owned units. So this includes Nanaimo fire rescue vehicles as well as ice resurfacers. 
Roberts. So in 2016, under the direction of the Asset Management Steering Committee, we undertook a comprehensive review of our asset management models. So what did this mean? It means we updated the inventory, we updated condition assessment information, and we also looked at our key assumptions, which is expected useful life, remaining useful life, replacement assumptions, as well as cost estimates. So we had a variety of people working in their field and their expertise, giving us this information, and then we plugged it all into our models. Then we had cross-departmental teams that got together, included operations <coughs> staff, finance staff, engineering staff, and we looked at those models and we went, okay, is it reasonable? Do those assumptions make sense based on what we know right now? And is the output from those models, does it make sense intuitively with what we know? We did lots of review of those models, we had multiple meetings, and we kept fine-tuning those models until it reflected the best information we had available at the time. Once we had that information, we then added the new and upgraded infrastructure required due to growth. And that comes from the proposed DCC project list. And this is a change from our last asset management update. It did not include new and upgraded infrastructure. It was focused strictly on renewal. Now, as Deb said, these asset management models are attention directing. So how does this play into our project planning? Well, from here, these models can give us ideas of what we need to look at in our condition assessment programs. For example, the sewer model tells us which segments of pipe we're expecting to reach end of useful life. Then Doris can take this information, work it into our condition assessment program, we go out, do CCTV camera work, and we go, yes, the pipe needs to be on our 20-year replacement plan. Maybe we can do a point repair and extend that life. Or the pipe is in better condition than we anticipated, and we can push it out in our model. We can do the same thing for facilities. We can identify which components are reaching end of useful life, such as a roof. It has an expected useful life of, say, 20 years. It's reaching that. We'll have an expert go out, look at the roof, and tell us how much time is actually remaining on that roof, and what is the expected cost of replacing that roof. Because we don't want to replace assets too soon, but we don't want to wait till they can replace them either. The other thing that our asset management models have told us is that the majority of our infrastructure is actually in good condition. You need to keep in mind though that the assets have different useful lives, everywhere from five years to a hundred years, and a lot of our linear assets are relatively new. Because a lot of pipes have a hundred year life, they haven't been in the ground a hundred years yet. So we do want to maintain that those assets in good condition and if we want to maintain the level of service we're currently providing that does mean, mean that we have to continue to invest in our infrastructure. Now I wanted to just do a high level overview of some of the models. So each of these models has other models that back them up because we go right down to each facility has its own model. This is the general fund model. This brings together the drainage, transportation, uh, park amenities, facilities, IT, and fleet models all into one so that you can see the total. The orange portion of the bar graphs reflects the required investment for renewal of existing infrastructure. And this is based on when we expect infrastructure to be renewed. And of course, as Deborah said, timing and cost do change as we get better information. The blue bars here, they reflect the expected investment needed for growth. So this is related to those DCC projects that Dale will talk about more. When we look at the sewer one, you will see that in 2018, we do have a big jump in the blue bar there. And that's related to, we have several sewer projects planned for 2018. Two of the bigger ones are the Chase Roof Trunk at four and a half million and Fillinger Crescent at 1.45 million. The other thing I'd like to point out is that our current 2017 to 2021 financial plan, we are using about $5 million in borrowing to fund sewer infrastructure. When we look at the water model, you're going to see that big jump out there in 2027 to 2030, and that's related to the new water supply dam. It's currently on our proposed DCC project list at $88 million, and about $85 million of that will be incurred between 2027 and 2030. But of course, that is subject to timing changes and requirements. We're not going to build a dam before we need it, so it's going to be a conservation and other measures like that which Bill can speak to, that could shift where that town would need to be built. So in addition to those life cycle models, the other thing the Asset Management Steering Committee works on is a number of initiatives. So I just wanted to highlight a few of them. 
One is the Leadership and Asset Management Program, or LEM. We are one of 12 municipalities in Canada that was selected to participate, and the group is working on templates for an asset management strategy, policy, framework, and governance. And then these templates can be other used by other municipalities in Canada to develop their own. As a result of this project, we will be bringing an asset management strategy and policy to Council later this year. We're also involved in a risk framework project. This one, right? Sorry. And this will provide us with the processes and tools to identify and manage risk in a consistent approach across the infrastructure. We're doing a natural capital pilot. We're one of five municipalities participating in this. And this is looking at the benefits um, of the butter tub marsh in stormwater. So as you can see, we're doing a bunch of different things here to improve how the city handles asset management. Great. Thank you. I'm sure there will be. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Councilor Hall. Sorry. Thank you. Just with that risk <coughs> framework one. Yes. Would Colliery Dams fall into that? Where we actually have a say in our risk as opposed to what the dam safety. So what this is, this is more for us to bring projects. So when we look at different projects, we would be able to give them a risk score and to rank them. Exactly with regards to that. Yeah. Comment. So it usually works better if you have your own risk framework. Yeah. Right? because it's usually not far off from the regulatory powers. But when you make your argument based on fact, life is a little bit different than when you're just trying to argue. So this would put us in a place where our argument is based on fact. So, for example, for Colliery Downs, had we had had this was based on the facts, so each 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 I think each event will be different. But what I'm saying is you whether you have this outside party looking inside and saying you should be doing this, it, it works a lot better if you're already managing the risk in some way. Uh, so you there are no surprises for you. Yeah. And when you're making your argument, you you're arguing from a point of strength. Right. So Thank you. Anything else, sir? Councillor Yoko and then Councillor um, thank you. Thank you for your presentation as well. Um, I don't know if the question would be for yourself or Mr. Sims, but looking at the um, asset, should there be a conversation in your guys' professional views? It's sort of a loaded question, uh, conversation, because the Nimbles all seem like the history of people long before us with the way up with the jump lake and Willis. We really think we progress around sewer and water, and I love that we have the best going water and the best sewer, music, like Victoria, et cetera. Is it, should the conversation be had, maybe think about the city um, having a conversation about buying the lands around the watershed to protect the watershed? When, when should that conversation take place? I'm not saying we're well, but it's warranted a conversation because it's pretty productive progressive thinking. I don't know if this is even the right place to answer that question. <laughs> Surprisingly, <laughs> Would any staff like that? He, he will speak. I'll be speaking to Councillor Hong. Okay, well, I'll let Councillor Hong go and then Mr. Simpson. Yeah, so me and Councillor Thorpe were at Harmac last week, and this actually talk did come up with management strategies um, with regard to the forest companies that were managing this. So one of the key things that we have to look at when we're buying this is not only are we talking about buying land, then we actually have to manage everything around that land, which would put this number way out of whack compared to what we need for asset management. So having forest companies, what they said to do it and manage the land with the regulatory bodies that they have to have to deal with and working with Mr. Sims and the city and everything else, it's in our best interest to let keep it in their hands because they just can't sell it off because we've had June Ross and other people come to us to tell us that, oh, they're just going to sell it to the Chinese and they're going to mine it and you're going to be screwed. But what we've learned is that it, it can't happen. You know, the provincial government won't let that happen in, in that sense from things what we gathered from their speech at, at that meeting with Western First Products. Mm -hmm. Sean and Woods. Yeah, that's different. <coughs> <coughs> is that pretty much what they said? So far. If, if I may, yes, uh, I asked the question of the forest industries and, and it related to watershed protection and, and that did come up both the possibility of buying watershed that it's prohibitively expensive and the point they made was that right now they are bearing the cost of of uh, maintaining that land and with the government controls that are on it uh, 
they were assuring us that it would be kept safe and secure. That was their argument. Um, it's tightly regulated, apparently. It's a fox guard in the hand. I was meant to yeah. whatever. So they said. Yeah, just quickly before Mr. Sims goes, is um, in fairness to that tour in Harmac and Industry, of course, he's going to say it's best in our hands. Like, but that's, a, that's, a, that's a, I don't want to digress that much. Anyways, I hear you say it. Sorry. Do you have something relative to this subject matter? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, everything I say is relative to everything. No, just on the, on the watershed. No, on the watershed. Right. So, so I'm happy to address it, uh, yeah. thank you, Mr. Chair. The, so it's, it's of course, subject to Council's decision whether they want to look at uh, purchasing the watershed and, and considering some of the benefits. You know, there's it, it's a huge discussion, yeah. and it, it's not something we probably want to shoehorn into this. But just briefly, as has been mentioned already, is that you know the, there's over 30 regulations under the Private Managed Forest Act uh, right now that. The forestry that's going on is managing for water quality, is managing for their their interests, but also for, for protecting our interests as well. That's a service that's provided that's kind of invisible to the taxpayer. It's, you know, they're looking after land management, uh, water quality management, sediment loading, um, invasive species, climate change, fire protection, et cetera, et cetera. If, if, if the city were to take that on, like it's, it's an emotional good thing. Yeah, we should have control of our watershed. If the city takes that on, it's an expensive proposition. And yeah. the question is, the question that council has to consider, of course, is that is that expense worth the benefit that we get? So that's that's the question. Right now, we've got, we have... We, you have this age-old discussion about does logging impact water quality. Um, my own opinion is that it may impact it marginally. We have such a large watershed, the logging that takes place is at such a small level. I can't say there's zero impact. I can't say that. But I can say that it's probably a very marginal impact. Not only that, we've built a facility that will handle the South Saskatchewan River. That's not what we're throwing at it. You, you can't halfway build a filtration plant. You have to build a filtration plant. It's incredibly robust. So there's all of those factors. We call them barriers. That, but at the same time, it's a it's an interesting discussion to have. It, it, we always hear that you know Vancouver owns its watershed, Capital Regional District owns its watershed, and there's a f very few other jurisdictions in North America. Vancouver built a filtration plant. They had like. They own their watershed, have for 100 years, and still needed to build the filtration plant. We're not trying to stop dirt. We're trying to stop pathogens. So we're blessed that we live on the West Coast. We get the first rains off the Pacific Ocean. The rest of North America receives its water downstream from somebody else. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good discussion to have, but it's, it's a, it'll increase our asset value tremendously. And it'll also increase our operational cost tremendously. But that's a question yeah. to look at the benefit. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. My, mine is on the watershed still. $400 million was the last time I heard there was a price on it. $400 million. But that gets us also an operational forest. I've always thought communities should control the forests around their areas. Fought back in the 90s, and 89 stated down as forestry conference where we should control our forests. There are our income, there are our futures, there are our past. And so if we bought that watershed, we just not only get the water, we get the forest industry, and we get the logging, and we could do real prime cut in there where the high value trees and only individual management, individual tree selection management, we could recreate forestry like we've talked about for decades. And we would own that watershed and own the forestry business. If First Nations can run a forestry business, I'm pretty sure we can, because SFN is a forestry business. Uh, I'm, and m and ran a forestry business, and I worked in that, so I understand. So an operational forest, it would get us our landscape, it would get us a natural environment. Green Mountain could open up again, and we could ski when I was like I was a little kid, and it's a phenomenal bioregion. So just buying a $400 million investment has more than just protecting the water and the dreamy thing of, of a unionized watershed. So that's, uh, that, that's my part on that. Then as far as the Colliery Dam, 
There is a social norm of acceptable risk. It's built into the Colliery or the Canadian Dam safety regulations. It's called equity versus efficiency, and it's a social norm. We didn't choose to use it. We didn't choose to fight for it. We didn't choose to jam it in the province's face. So thank you, Councillor Holm, for that. Mr. Mayor, did you wish to comment? No, I was just going to reiterate what Mr. Sim said that that's I think the watershed issue is a is a, is a, is a, is a larger conversation to have. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if it's something we want to revisit at some other time, we'll do that. But if we could just. I, I just have a couple of questions. Um, on your graph there, you had uh, parks amenities where I said I could get 34 lanes, something like that. Yeah. <coughs> Was that. Now, did that in, encompass all of our facilities or just our? So that is the seven recreational dams, uh, playground equipment, sports fields, and trails. So, uh, so where are facilities fit? They fall under the facilities. So buildings, all our buildings fall under facilities. Park amenities is other types of right, So we don't separate parks facilities from <coughs> No, we don't. The oh, the only facility built that gets separated out is the water treatment plant. It shows it shows up here in this facility's total, but then it won't show in general. It'll show underwater because any work we do on the water treatment plant would be funded from water reserves and user fees. And now, Dale, uh, just one more. Oh, if I may, I, I can't let you move on without a quick comment of thanks. I just find speaking for myself, it's very easy to get wrapped up in the day-to-day -day issues and, and just deal with that and forget about the longer term. And I'm really impressed with the work that has gone into looking forward and planning for the future. And I just want to thank our staff for that. I, I think what we've done here, the 20-year plan and updating our asset management models, the city should be really excited about it. We are looking, as we said, is attention directing. It's helping us determine strategies for the future so that we're not reactive, we're being proactive in what we're doing. Thank you. Now, Dale Lindsay is going to speak to the TCC review. Can I, can I have it's an interesting thing with um, the reach, with development of assets as buildings, I'll say, because we talk about facilities. So we used to have the model where our facility ran out with more of the money and kind of did it, and, and it paid it over that time. Currently now we're saving for the future a lot. We're putting that critical infrastructure or strategic infrastructure fund aside now. So we're actually taxing people now for a facility we might build. And for me, if I, do, if I finish paying taxes in 10 years and nothing gets built in that fund, I will never get the access to that, although I'm putting it to my community. So the theory typically is user pay now more. So if I want to build something new now, the, the new people pay for it. Right, so I <coughs> borrow and pay during that time. But I like reserves for emergency funding and that dark day. But pre billing for things is kind of, it's like a pre billing. It's like the stuff that some of us don't like, but it's important to build that asset. So how do we how do we value that as a council? Do we bill people now a little bit so we can build something in the future? Like the example I use is the Port Theater. We have to put three hundred thousand dollars in our budget just in case they want to borrow the four million in twenty sixteen. Well, they didn't borrow, but it was in the budget. Now it goes into a reserve, I believe. So we pre-tax things. Is that? Well, I think with the asset management reserve, and Deborah may want to jump in, but my comment on the asset management reserve is we're putting money aside to replace something that current users are using. You're using the life of that asset, and eventually it has to be replaced. So you're paying for today's use because the asset's life is decreasing as you use it. It's a sub it's subsidized because my user fees don't pay for it. No. It's subsidized. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thanks very much. Dale. Good afternoon. What are you doing? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I, it, I, it was funny, I was speaking as Council Chris was asking that question. I think that's a perfect segue to talk about DCCs. So, thank you. Um, oh, yeah, I'll just skip ahead a few seconds. Back to show them one slide. Um, 
So I think when uh, we did our, our first orientation session with council after the election, we spent a part of that time with my talking about I know that was a long time ago, and I know we threw a lot of information at you at that time. So I, I'd just like to take maybe two minutes and just do like a little DCC uh, background or review. Overall, the things I want to talk to you, uh, in addition to giving you that background, is really talk about the framework of the DCC bylaw, um, give you the draft DCC rates that we're looking at, and I want to emphasize their draft DCC rates at this point, and then talk about the next steps that we have to go through in terms of the ultimate adoption of the bylaw implementation of a new DCC. Um, DCCs are, it's actually the 30 year anniversary that DCCs have been allowed uh, to be collected. BC legislation came in in 1977. Before that, in kind of the 50s and 60s, communities were under this assumption that growth paid for itself. It was a big party, nobody worried about it. So 60s come along, people started to realize that there's actually some implications here, and municipalities started charging the individual fees. The province got involved in sale, and that doesn't quite work. There's a bunch of unlocked, uh, cases that came out, case law, and, that. and they, at that time, the response was land use contracts. And, and they started <coughs> giving them power for a brief period of time in the 70s that they'd run around and sign basically these contracts with developers to deal with this issue. That only lasted for about four or five years. 1977 comes along, they actually put the legislation in place to allow for DCCs. 1982, the first time we ever actually implemented DCCs in the city. What year was that? 1982. So we've had DCCs since 1982. So the first question is really, you know, what, what are um, DCCs? And really, this is the shortest explanation I can come up with, but it's really about collecting monies from development to offset the cost of the infrastructure required for that new development. If you want to look at the really, in simple terms, how a DCC is determined, you look at the, the cost of that infrastructure to service that new growth, you divide it up amongst that growth, that gives you your DCC rate. That's overly simplified and we'll go into, uh, we'll go into some more detail, but at a high level, that's how it works. We, like everything we do, we're creatures of the province. Uh, the legislation in the local government act on DCCs was on, I don't know, it's 15 or 20 pages long. It was one, uh, one portion of it. Um, and what I wanted to point out here um, is, is that DCCs are for the collection of the very basic infrastructure allowed for growth. It's not for all services. And, and you can see here it talks about we collect DCCs for providing the construction um, or expansion of sewer, water, drainage, and highway facilities. It's pretty specific. It also allows for parkland. So not included in there are some of those other, you can probably think of a ton of other costs that are associated with development, but it doesn't allow for collection of DCCs for transit. It doesn't allow for collection of DCCs for police or, or new fire halls or uh, community centers. There's a, there's a long list of things that we are not allowed under the legislation to collect DCCs. <coughs> The legislation slips these little words in here. Uh, and at first when you read this, you think it means nothing. Uh, but that word actually plays a big uh, part of what we do, and we're going to come back to it. But it provides the ability for us to collect funds to assist with these costs. And we're going to clearly circle back on that and talk about it a little bit later. Um, so for us in the city, with this legislation in place, we currently collect uh, DCCs, we have uh, DCC for, for sanitary collection, DCC for storm, DCC for water distribution, our roads DCC, a water supply, separate water supply DCC, our parks DCC, and we also collect on behalf of the RDN for the sanitary DCC. So anything we collect with the sanitary DCC, we collect with development, we transfer that to the, to the RDN. But if you're sitting at the RDN table, you'll be aware that they adopt their own sanitary uh, DCC bylaws out there, and they often come to the city and do their updates and presentations. But at the end of the day, it's the board that establishes that. We simply collect for them. However, when you hear someone say, oh, the city of Nanaimo, it's $16,000 for a DCC or single family, they're lumping in all of these categories. So they're including in that number the, the sanitary DCC, because of course if you're a developer, you don't really care who's getting the money, you just care how much you're, you're paying. Um, some examples maybe, if you can think about what, we, what we've used DCCs for uh, recently, um, you know, the, the upgrades on, on Millstone, uh, the butter tubs, 
the work that's underway right now to provide for the connection to Lindley Valley uh, with the new intersection on Rutherford. Those are all projects that are going to use DCC monies uh, to pay or to assist with them. Um, the actual process uh, for establishing DCC rates, uh, really it's about looking at what we anticipate for growth over a defined period of time, how much new development do we anticipate to see in the community, and then we look at what do we need to do to the infrastructure that we have to upgrade it, or what new infrastructure do we need. And that's where we, we walk through, look at all of the specific projects that are required to facilitate this, and then using that simple math formula I showed you at the start, we come up with, with new DCC rates. So where we are, and, and, and I have to emphasize, this part is a really, it's a really technical process. And we've gone through all that technical work, looking at projects, looking at our growth estimates, looking at all the projects, and that brings us to this point where we have these DCC rates. The next step is to talk about what we call to talk to the community and the stakeholders about these uh, DCC bylaws, <coughs> get their feedback, and actually draft a bylaw that would come forward to council. So, so that those steps have yet to occur, and that's one of the things we're looking for in direction today is, is to proceed on with that stakeholder consultation. So the first step, um, confirming uh, our growth estimates. So first of all, we're looking at a time frame, uh, 2041. And 2041 happens to be the same time frame that you uh, adopted as part of your transportation master plan. And the population estimates were, were done for that document are the ones that were used here. Uh, so over that, over those years, we're, uh, we're anticipating about 33,000 new residents in the community. So that brings us from around 90,000 today to up to about 123,000 people by 2041, and about a one and a quarter percent annual annual growth rate. Uh, just under 18,000 new dwelling units is what we anticipate in this planning time frame. And we're looking at new commercial office of about 2.2 million square feet over those over those approximately 25 years. Uh, so that's about uh, 70, sorry, it's about 8,200 square meters a year, or about 90,000 square feet of commercial, and a very similar amount uh, for industrial. So each and every year over those 20, 25 years. I'll note here that these projections are, especially when you look at commercial uh, retail, are substantially lower than what the assumptions we made under the last DCC bottle. They're about half. That's if you have lower growth rates, but your costs for projects are the same or greater, you can kind of get a sense of where your DCC rates are, are going to go. But I, would point, I just want to point that out right now. What is new industrial? Uh, so any kind of new industrial project, so any any um, development built out in uh, Green Rock development, for example, warehousing. Uh, okay. The actual construction category. That's correct, yes. yes. So that's chart, lots of information here, but to start with, I just want to focus on the, the, the three columns on the left here. And again, these are the different types of infrastructure that all relate to the DCCs that we have right now. Each of those infrastructure types will have a number of projects associated with them. Um, so maybe just to, to pick on uh, water, water supply, for example. So we have, there's actually 10 different projects that are identified. We know that those 10 different projects, the total cost will be about $130 million to build those 10 projects. Um, the relative to existing uh, project costs, I put that in there because I wanted to get a sense of if you look at our existing DCC bylaw and the number of projects and the cost in there, are we going up, are we going down, or is it relatively the same? So you can see in some categories we're going up. So for the roads, no, and that's the most substantial, under the current DCC bylaw, the total project cost is about $104 million. You can see here $221 million, so a very substantial cost, uh, increase in project costs. However, we have other areas where the actual cost of projects uh, have, have gone down. Um, so, and it was mentioned earlier, I think Deborah mentioned it earlier in the presentation about this idea of a benefit factor, and she used the example, I think, of a, a sewer line or something you mentioned. The one I, the one I can think of is, so if we identify projects, <coughs> it's um, um, replacement of a, a water reservoir, and that, that water reservoir has already been in place and it serves a big chunk of our community, but it's nearing the end of its life, it needs to be replaced. At the same time, we know that water reservoir needs to be upsized to accommodate the growth that we anticipate in the community. So it's not fair to say new growth is going to pay for that entire water reservoir. You need to then 
that what we call benefit in fact when you allocate how much of that water reservoir is for existing residents, how much of it is for new development. So you would take that methodology, apply it to every single project we look at, and at the end of the day, you end up with a number that looks at allocating to existing and then a separate number uh, allocating to growth. So when we calculate DCCs, we're looking at this number distributed over all of the growth that we're anticipating in this 25 years. So does that make sense? 25 years, or 20? Uh, 25, so 20, 2041. <clears throat> so once we've, we've gone through... Now we've gone through these first two steps, we've looked at the estimates, we've looked at our projects, <coughs> project costs, and we do the math, and we, we come up with uh, DCC rates. And we'll go into these in a little more detail, but you can see under the current uh, program, we're looking at about just under $16,000 for a standard uh, single family lot. These are our new DCCs before you include the RDN. And I'll show you another slide that includes the RDN DCC. But that's before you look at RDN DCCs. Uh, multi family, and I'm going to talk about this more, but we have a range of uh, DCC rates, which is a little bit different in the methodology than what we have now. Uh, commercial ends up at uh, $150 per square meter. <coughs> Industrial 35, mobile homes, about $10,000 for each new mobile home pad created in a mobile home park, and about $3,300 for each new uh, spot in a, in a campground created within the city. So some, some comparison between those numbers I just told you about and where we are today. Uh, so again, it's a single family. Now, for this time, I've included the RDN DCC, so we will just take that off there soon. RDN sanitary sewer, you can see how those have been included in. They've, they've just recently, they're going through a process of reviewing their DCC, so under their, their current, it's about 2,200 per lot, but you'll see here for uh, their new model, it's about 2,900. So what I've showed you, existing versus proposed, I'm assuming that RDN model is being, is being adopted. So if you combine both, it's about $16,000 per every new lot created in the city, residential lot for DCCs. And we're looking at that number based on the technical work we've done today to be just under 19, $18,850 uh, with a note in there that we have a new new rate for small lot DCCs. And I'm going to talk more about that later, but I just I would put a marker there that there's that separate rate. Multifamily today, six dollars per square meter. We're having a range of uh, rates, but it ranges from ninety dollars a square meter to up to one hundred thirty-five. Uh, commercial industrial, this is the latest jump under the work that's been done today. Eighty-three dollars per square meter uh, increases to one hundred sixty-six. Industrial twenty-one to almost forty. Mobile home parks uh, up from just under ten thousand to just under twelve thousand. Campgrounds, 2,400 to about 3,800. 30, uh, and of course, we always get the question of um, how do our rates compare to what someone else is doing? How do our rates compare to what Columbus New Campus do for George or our, our more, like our neighbors here in Parkville, that's what we It's really difficult to compare DCC rates from one community to another. Everybody does it a little bit differently. Everybody sets up different zones. Some municipalities you might go to, they might have, um, Michelle can speak to this more, she's the expert on it, but they might have 10 different categories on single family lots. So who do you, what do you pick to compare to? Some municipalities might say, we don't charge uh, multifamily rate DCCs based on size, we just do it on a unit charge, where we charge based on a per square meter charge. So it gets difficult. <coughs> some have, they collect on behalf of the region they're in, some don't have those collections. We have her put some numbers together here for you just for comparison's sake. Um, I think these are, are these included in the attachment uh, that, that are with the report, I believe. We need to look at more closely, but Inevitably, through a DCC review process, and as we get through the stakeholder, this question is going to come up, and it's going to be something ultimately that, that you'll be requesting re to reflect on um, as we're bringing forward new rates. I just wanted to highlight, and uh, in the report that we we gave you, that's attached to your agenda, um, we, we touched on what I would describe as more four of the more substantive amendments uh, that we're proposing as part of this DCC bylaw review and rewrite. Um, we're looking at uh, a new model for how you calculate roads DCCs. Uh, right now, if you if you do a development anywhere outside of the downtown, uh, you're going to pay, and if you're doing multifamily, you're going to pay the same DCC rate. 
It doesn't matter if you're doing uh, an apartment building on Woodgrove Mall or if you're doing a condominium out at the end of Hamden Road, or students in point, you're paying the seat. DCCs are intended to reflect the capital cost burden of a project on the infrastructure. So all of our policy documents, all of our directives are trying to uh, encourage growth around our nodes with the idea being that if you're multifamily and you're next to Woodgrove Mall, you're more likely to walk to services, you're more likely to take transit, those options are available to you. Um, you're more likely to, to cycle, where if you're out uh, further in other, maybe on the fringes of the community, you have less options available, you're going to be more likely to drive bigger impact on infrastructure. So the best the best, manage, the best practices guide talks about reflecting that, and we've used the model that the province describes in, best man, in their best management practices for establishing DCC. So we've gone to this new, new way of looking at um, specifically multi-family DCC rates. Instead of having this one uh, rate across the community, we'd actually have a hierarchy of, of four different DCC rates for roads DCCs, and this reflects the work that you've done in both your official community plan and your transportation master plan. <coughs> Essentially, it would result in lower DCCs if you build multi-family in and around the growth nodes where we say development should be encouraged. Uh, stormwater DCCs is another area we do too. So today, if, if you come into the city and you build a uh, 100,000 square foot building on one floor, or if you build a 100,000 square foot building on 10 floors, we charge you the same stormwater DCC because it's based on a gross floor area calculation. Again, getting back to this idea of capital cost burden. If you think about that one-story building of 100,000 square feet, it covers much more ground space, so it's going to have much more total service, service uh, which results in more runoff, where a building that's on a much smaller footprint uh, doesn't have that same amount of, of lot coverage, doesn't have the same impact on infrastructure. So we're actually looking at changing the way that we calculate that, and it's no longer going to be based on gross floor area, but it's going to be based on the actual lot coverage or the, the size of that building at the first floor, how much how much uh, coverage is on that lot. And we think that's much more representative and reflective of what, uh, of what the capital cost burden would be for runoff. Uh, and I mentioned this earlier, we have a new rate in here for, for small lots. And this is something we're, we're hearing quite often over the last number of years. The new zoning bylaw came in a uh, handful of years ago now, and it had provisions in there for small lot zoning. Uh, we also have provisions in there for row house. Right now, we only have one DCC rate. So it doesn't matter if you come in and create a large lot or create a small lot, you're paying the same DCC. And we, we've heard quite clearly from the industry that there's a need to reflect upon that and look at a different model. So we've proposed a small lot DCC. And I, would, I want to be clear, it's not just necessarily that if you're in a small lot zone, we're putting some parameters around it, that if you're less than 370 square meters or if you're a small lot in a row housing development, you then would be eligible for a small lot DCC. Somebody's been asking me why 370 square meters. It's because suites are not allowed in small lots less than 370 square meters. The other, the last and uh, potentially most significant when we go and talk to stakeholders is a real different, a different approach on how we look at our nodes. So right now under the DCC bylaw, we have downtown is exempt. The entire rest of the community is treated the same, whether you're in a growth node, a mobility hub, or if you're on the fringe of the community. So it's really going back to this idea of looking at uh, recognizing our policy documents, rec recognizing our objectives of encouraging development throughout our uh, growth nodes and along our corridors. And again, as I said, you move towards this, this model that reflects a balance of growth in our policy documents. The, mo the model that we're generally proposing where you, you try to reflect uh, all of the growth nodes in the community versus the current the current DCC file, which is if you're in downtown or, or you're in Those are, those are the four major areas that we would talk about changes to the framework. This is circling back to that point I made at the start about assist. <coughs> the, they slipped this word in here. But it really means that we can't allocate 100% of the cost of all new infrastructure that's required for growth to that growth. There has to be an assist factor, and that and the council can't refer to this earlier. 
So today, we have a 1% assist factor for all categories except for water supply is a 25% assist factor. And this is the area where council has the ability to influence DCC rates. We, we come forward with a really technical document that looks at the projected growth, that looks at the cost of projects. If council thinks that DCC rates are too high in one infrastructure category, the way to reduce those is to look at the assist factor. Uh, so you could increase you could increase an assist factor, which would make the DCC rates go down. But you're but at the same time, by doing that, you're putting pressure on taxation. Somebody needs to pay for that difference. So you're putting pressure on taxation or user rates to increase. If you do it too high, the assist factor is too high. What can happen? And if you're if the future council is not willing to increase taxes to pay for that difference, those projects just simply don't happen. Growth simply can't happen. So there's, there's a balance there to be made about what's the appropriate uh, assist factor. Excuse me. When would I make a motion that would state that Nanaimo offers no assist factor on DCCs outside of the borders of Nanaimo? When would that be appropriate to make a motion like that or a notice of that motion? I'm going to go through the next steps here, and, but I think one of the, the key steps is going out to get some stakeholder input, talking to all the committees. Well, mine's about water supply outside of the non boundaries. That's what my concern is, where we give an assist factor of 25% to an outside agency. They pay the same prices the taxpayers of the mine. And that assist factor is to benefit the taxpayers of the mine. <coughs> but we're offered that same price with no buy-in, no real buy-in. So that's what my idea I have in the motion. I think at 6A and 6B coming up, we have some recommendations. I don't know if it is appropriate inside. I'd like to at least bring it forward for discussion. In terms of the, the next steps, um, so we've very much gone through that technical work that I talked about. We need to get out uh, and talk to the committees. We need to get out and engage with stakeholders and the general public. That'll help us to ultimately inform how we're going to write this bylaw. Once, we, once we've done that, we would uh, introduce the draft bylaw to council. We would recommend it's not, it's not a requirement, but it's a best practice to actually have something like a public hearing, a public meeting after <coughs> the second reading. Uh, consider third reading. This is a, a bylaw that requires the approval of the province, so after third reading, it would be sent to the province for approval of the inspector of municipalities. Then we'd bring that for fourth reading. This is one bylaw where you often have an implementation date that's a number of months out from when the bylaw is actually adopted. That's again something that we'd be looking at through the stakeholder uh, feedback through that public process is what's the appropriate date for, uh, for implementation of, of a new DCC bylaw. That's the end of my presentation. Any questions? Thanks very much, Jeff. Um, questions? Thank you. I don't know if I'm offside on this question, but thank you for your update because I would have failed the test from the beginning of our term. But anyways, um, I heard, I hear, I don't know if it's this rhetoric, but it's like, what's the thousand dollars a door or something? Uh, Nothing to do with this. Yeah, two different things. So that's our council has a community amenity contribution uh, policy. So in terms of rezoning application, the idea is that when you rezone a piece of land, you're doing that land lift. And the current policy is that if you're doing that for multifamily, that there should be a, an amenity that comes back to the community. It's pretty low. The policy is a thousand dollars a door. We have a council motion uh, on the books to review our. Okay. So we'll look at that down the road. Separate, but well, it's important. It's separate from DCCs. Okay. Sorry. Oh, that's a good question. Anybody else? Somebody else? I, I just have a couple of help. I mean, um, in the downtown cores, we, so we waive the DCCs. So could you help me understand the difference between DCCs and works and services? Because there's to apply charges to development, works and services, and DCCs, but we waive the DCCs. So I, I can be very specific to a specific project if you would like, if that would help. Okay. So. Um, the uh, and, and that's a good point. So works and services are are separate again from DCCs. So if a if a subdivision comes in a subdivision of land, or if there is a new commercial or industrial development anywhere in the community, downtown or outside of downtown, 
they're responsible for frontage works and services. And those frontage works and services could be curb, gutter, sidewalk, street lighting, repaving to the center line of the road on all frontages of your development. Um, so if you're coming in and you're, and you're subdividing a lot in the middle of an existing neighborhood, um, the bylaws could ask you to do all of those frontage works along the new lots that you're creating. If you're coming in to, uh, to an area that has commercial zoning and, and the frontages don't meet the current city standards when you come in to build a new building, you can be responsible for the curb gutter sidewalks uh, in front of those buildings. So, um, maybe think of uh, the building that was built most recently by the, the hospital um, on the corner of Dufferin and Boundary there. There's, a, there's an office building that was built. That site, when they came in and were uh, obtained a building permit to build that, they were actually responsible for doing those services along the frontage there. Um, any new single family subdivision you drive to works and services. If the developments get into downtown and the frontages um, don't meet current standards or they need to be upgraded, that development could trigger frontage, trigger frontage works and services. But again, it's it's separate about separate from whether again the project would be responsible for KPCs. Two two different things, but both both of them ultimately are cost to the development community. So let me just follow that up, please. So is it, uh, curb gutter sidewalks is lighting included in <coughs> Yes, curb gutter sidewalks, street lighting, and potential repaving in the rebuilding the road base if, it's, if it doesn't work. And if we were to not waive the DCCs in the downtown, whatever red light core, I think it's purple on the map, is part of your recommendations that we maintain uh, waiving of DCCs in the downtown core? In the red lined area, or is there some other balance in there? Or? No, the, the framework that we are proposing right now would see DCCs being collected. <coughs> would see it, yes. And so per lot, anywhere between $12,000 and $18,000. Well, and again, small lot or yeah, keep in mind you don't see too much from the way of single family uh, subdivision in the, in the downtown. Like Mostly we can see multi family or commercial development. So if you're um, under the draft DCC rates, if you're doing multi family uh, development in the downtown, you'd be looking at $90 a square meter. And commercial, where it's outside of the downtown, it's 166 in the downtown would be 98 so with the current draft rates. But it moves from right now, there's there's no DCCs available. Thank you. Any other questions? Motion to receive the three presentations would be in order then. Moved by Councilor Clark, second by Councilor Jokum. Any discussion? All in favor? So the report, so we've just done the presentation. <laughs> now we want to recommend this, and now so now we'll move into just to finish six A. Just try to follow the process. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. We're following the process. Okay. Uh, so, um, would you like to introduce the next portion of the process? Six A of the process. So, so through the chair, uh, we, we're done with the presentations. Now we are on six A. Uh, there's a report, pages fifty-three to one hundred. And uh, the purpose of that report is to outline the 20 investment plan and asset management update report. The recommendation from staff is that the finance and audit committee recommend that council approve continuing the annual 1% property tax increase to 2022 for contributions to the general asset management fund reserve and include this change in the annual 2017-2021 financial plan to be adopted by council before May 15, 2017. Thank you. Now, now would you like a motion prior to Ms. Duncan continuing with any information share or how would you like to proceed with this? Uh, you probably want to do the motion and then part of the discussion would be to fill in those gaps. So the motion is that recommendation for staff. Moved by, uh, okay. so the recommendation as as written. Yeah. Right. Written. Moved by Council Brent, second by Council Kip. Any discussion and or follow-up information warranted, please. 
So whatever you, it was that you wanted to bring to the table. <laughs> now it's on the floor. Let's a recap. Okay, so here's a quick recap, and these are the recommendations, and they vary by fund, because uh, the challenge is for fund, challenges to win more, but a little bit easier. So for the general fund, what we're recommending is we can project this funding gap of $124 million over the next 20 years. $43 million of that should be addressed through the DCC review and the new rates. Uh, what we are proposing is that uh, the 1% increase is continued to 2022 as a way to close that gap. And that's for the general fund. So that's everything excluding the sewer and water. For the sewer fund, we have a projected funding gap of $24 million that has to do with the DCCs. And it will be uh, uh, closed through the DCC review. At the end of 20 years, we are projecting to have a positive reserve balance for non-DCC projects. And we're going to talk about reserve balances a little bit further along. Water fund, we have a projected funding gap of $121 million of which $50 million to be addressed through the DCC review, $71 million to be addressed through user fee and using debt. Because as we saw in those uh, graphs that Wendy showed us, that uh, spike in water happens towards the end of 20 years. So what we'll do is we'll use, likely use borrowing towards the end to reduce that spike and push it out another 20 years. Yeah, another recommendation here is, of course, council support for continued development of the city's asset management system. We will be bringing forward a draft policy, asset management policy, and a draft asset management strategy. I think the strategy means it's how does the city deliver its asset management system? Do we have a steering committee? Who is responsible for that? And what are some of the specific initiatives that we want to move ahead with in our end to continue to develop our asset management system? We've talked about risk management and the risk framework here. And we have our manager of infrastructure planning, Doris Fournier, is leading that project in asset management. We'll be bringing information probably forward on that later. And levels of service and performance monitoring. That is the second phase of our LAMP project, is developing levels of service and performance measures. The final one here is developing financial policies, and I think our CFO has talked about that before, and that is developing a debt policy and a reserve policy. We don't have those right now. And what we want to do is make sure we have the right reserves in place. We want to maybe talk about minimum and maximum balance of their reserves, and we want to know that we have those annual contribution strategies that will help us achieve organizational goals. We put this together. This is and this is just a way to look at the impact. What we accomplish and look at the impact that we are presenting. So this is the general fund only. This is the projected investment over the next 20 years, excluding DCCs. This is the funding level we're at now. Our funding level five years ago was down here. But with that asset putting in that one percent, we're now up to here. And what we're hoping to do is bring it up to here. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Richard, is there anything else that you would like to add to the conversation? No. Any questions or comments or concerns from council? We do have uh, we do have a motion on the floor. Uh, this motion then would go to open council. From this As motion. a recommendation, yes. This recommendation. And when would that arrive? Two or three weeks from now. Uh, obviously, it should be at the next council meeting because we want this to impact the 2017-2021 financial plan. Okay, thank you. I'll call the question. All in favor? Okay, in favor, Mayor. Opposed? Sure. Thank you. Mr. Mema, if you could please introduce item 6B. Item 6 B deals with the development cost charge file and the recommendations. There's three of them. Uh, the first one is that the Finance and Audit Committee recommend that Council direct staff to number one, refer the draft development cost charge rates and framework to the Community Plan and Development and Public Works and Engineering Committees for review and comment. 
Number two, initiate public engagement and <coughs> consultation with relevant stakeholders regarding a new development cost charge bylaw. And number three, upon completion of the above, prepare a new development cost charge bylaw for council's consideration. Okay. <coughs> Second by Councillor Brennan. Any discussion? Uh, I, I just have uh, a, a question, if I may, to staff, please. <clears throat> Mike, uh, by virtue of increasing to <coughs> the DCCs to the level to contribute to our shortfall, might development be stymied in some cases, which then there is no development or, or less development as a result, understanding that the cost will be passed on to the consumer, clearly. Uh, but I'm just curious as to, and don't get me, I, I, I support the DCC increase, but I'm just curious as to what that may due to potential growth and development. I think yeah, that's a good point because that one of the things in that, remember I said those 15 or 20 pages of legislation, one of the things that's in there is it says we must consider uh, the impact that these rates will have on development. So that's part of, part of the reason we want to go do the stakeholder engagement and get feedback from people in the development industry, from the general community, from our committees uh, to get it, to better be able to answer answer that question. So again, when we get that feedback and we come back, the one way council can address that is through is through the assist factor. Uh, but that's something that has to be determined by council. Just to follow up, the, reason, the reason I ask that question is because clearly this will be extremely political. We'll be he heavily lobbied throughout the course of the, of the process to get to the completion of the reviews. So which brings me to my last question. The, the timeliness of this. Will this be a 2017 assumed completion? Our hope would be to have a bylaw in front of you um, quarter two. So we want to see something in front of you uh, in June. The question would then be, what is the implementation date for that bylaw? So I can't say what this one would be, but for example, you might see the bylaw in June, you'd adopt it in the fall, but you would have an implementation date of 20. Uh, 2018 at some point. November 16th. <laughs> Thank you. So that brings me to then. I'm sorry, I thought it was my last question. But then, um, it, well, we're looking at the potential have a having an implementation date considerably following the bylaw adoption. Is there a grandfathering component that, that would be contemplated? So if there's things in I, I, I don't know how that would work yeah, with grandfather. Well, that's a good point, because the legislation also provides for that. Uh, it was up until just a couple of years ago, it was you had to have a building permit submitted before the implementation date uh, to be grandfathered. Uh, so if, so we, what would happen is we'd have an implementation date of January 1st, and we'd have people lined up out the door on December 30th to submit their building permit application, knowing that they have a year to pick that permanent permit application up. What actually the province did uh, more recently is they actually expanded that list of, of how to be in stream. So it's no longer just building permits, it's building permits, development permits, rezonings. Anybody who's got an active development application is actually in stream. We still need to get, get through that process and get your building permit within one year of the implementation date. So yes, there'll be a big push to get applications in the door, and there'll be a big push to get them out the door before that one year, uh, one year anniversary date comes. Just a comment. We bring DCCs back to the downtown area for those ten-story projects and potential. Sorry, can I comment on that? Because I think that's something that um, we might want to look at is you can look at different implementation dates for different parts of the bylaws. So theoretically, you could have an implementation date for one part of the community at one date, and you could have a deferred implementation date for the downtown, for example, to address that to address that variation. I'll leave that up to you guys. Uh, any other comments or questions? 
uh, arising. There being none, I'll call the question. Uh, now, shall we do the? Must these be done in the block or or sorry, Adam, or does it matter? I think you can do them in the block. Unless there's one particular one you want to do. Nothing I wish. Call the question. All in favor? Opposed. Motion carried unanimously. Other business. No other business. Yes. Yeah. Well, mine would be that portion that I discussed, but I think I'll spend forward some stuff to the line about. You know, I guess my concern is that the local land spillage, for example, we have an outstanding assist factor in the water um, that we were offered to them as every hookup to pay at the similar fee as in the nine. Um, so there was, there's an assist factor in it. So that's what I want to address something on this. Could you, may I suggest that you do you also a motion to staff yeah. for this committee? Yeah. And then go from the yeah. Be fair? Yeah. So I deal with the where we're going to with you. Okay. Uh, question for you. Fred. No, <laughs> uh, one more. The mayor of Sunset has to be waiting for this. All right, we're all good. Now, motion to adjourn. Uh, just, oh, sorry. sorry. Oh, just just one question you leave. So, thank you so much. What did we meet again? No, 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 we didn't do anything wrong. You broke the policy. We meet next week. So we meet next week. Meeting. That's what I wanted to talk about. Okay. So, we're going to meet next week. This was a makeup meeting. So, we're going to meet next week on Wednesday. And there's heavy lifting to be done on Wednesday. Yeah. We're going to bring an update to our financial plan. We're going to bring our draft property tax file. Those are heavy lifts for you to deal with. We'll get them out of the door probably by Friday morning if we're late, so we have time to read them. And that's all we needed to bring to your attention. What, what, what about the uh, downtown grants? Uh, Dale and I will take a quick chat. Oh, we'll send you an email. Because if we don't get to that, then okay. some of those events that start aren't going to get funding. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll for planning advice. May I just ask you a question, please? The, the information that we're going to do next Wednesday, we're going to get on Friday? Uh, I think we're almost ready to get it out of the door. So we'll get and it. And it will be on? On your iPads. And, okay. Yes. We'll get it out as soon as possible. We wanted to go through this today because sure. that's part of the assumptions. So. Um, and what time next Wednesday? It's nine thirty. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, that's good. Motion to thank you for the Okay.